Good morning and uh, thank you, uh, Audrey, for the uh, kind words. Uh, I'm very excited about this conference for a number of reasons. Uh, I've been advisor to the Malaysian Student Group for over 12 years. And uh, most of the time, Malaysian students uh, are known throughout the campus for being some of the uh, most studious, hardworking, as well as the uh, highest performing students uh, at ISU. Uh, Malaysian students are also known for being very uh, civic conscious, very community minded, raising money for students, Iowan students, not Malaysian students, uh, whose family uh, have been uh, hurt by the farm crisis. And Malaysian students were also known to have raised uh, funds for the elderly or flood victims and so on. Uh, we, have, we have a tradition of uh, community service to the uh, extent that uh, uh, most every Malaysian night event, uh, Governor Branstad has declared that particular day uh, Malaysia Day in Iowa. And that says a lot about uh, Malaysian uh, students and their impact on the state of Iowa. The reason I'm particularly proud about this uh, uh, gathering here is that uh, you all look very smart in your suits and uh, fine attire, uh, simply because uh, this is the first attempt, not only just by Malaysian students, but by any student group uh, at ISU. And I would even go further to say that perhaps this is the first uh, student organized leadership conference uh, anywhere in any university uh, in, in America. And for this, I give tremendous credit to the leadership, uh, to uh, President uh, Chang Luan and his uh, executive committee uh, for putting the time to uh, pull together the resources, fundraising, getting the programs, and uh, uh, promoting the programs and so on, and getting uh, uh, this show into a, uh, into a, uh, a reality. Uh, you know, this is the first leadership conference, and particularly I'd like to uh, recognize something that is, uh, to me, absolutely incredible. Right here in this hall, we have four generations of AMSISU presidents. Isn't that incredible? From 1988, uh, Liao Choi. Liao, please stand. Choi was the uh, president who first who organized the first Malaysia Night program that uh, raised uh, $14,000 for high students who uh, could come back as a result, or could come back to finish education as a result of what Malaysian students had done. And uh, you, you wouldn't believe this, but we had won the hearts and minds of Iowans uh, from all four corners of the state uh, by that particular gesture. Uh, we have uh, President, uh, ex-president Chin Yuan Tai uh, with us. And uh, the current president, uh, uh, Luan Chang. And this is absolutely incredible. You talk about leadership. And part of this uh, conference teaches me another lesson. And that lesson is a sense of continuity, a sense of history, a sense of uh, being loyal to the ideal that uh, you know, when, as Malaysians here in the States, uh, this is home away from home. And not only that, we're trying to you know, recreate a situation where we benefit by working together, by understanding that you know, this is not just a preparatory stage, but that we need to seize the opportunities to serve and to lead. A true leader is a servant of all, and this is what this you know, conference, I hope, helps to impart. The part of leadership is knowing who you are. Part of leadership is sensing a vision to share, to serve, and to lead. And uh, why pick uh, John Nesbitt's book, uh, Megatrends uh, Asia, uh, to you know, use as a platform for this conference? Uh, a number of reasons. Uh, initially, we hope to raise enough money so that we can buy a copy for every participant. But the book costs 25 bucks and we have a limited budget, and so uh, we cannot do it, but uh, I've tried to summarize you know, the key ideas in this, uh, from this book uh, into the notes we'll find in the uh, in, uh, manual. And if you, if you look at the manual, uh, in the first uh, white uh, uh, section here, you see the uh, uh, notes from Megatrends, uh, which you can uh, follow as I uh, you know, sketch out some, some ideas behind uh, what's really happening in Asia today. Don't you think that this uh, manual is a handsome looking manual? I think it 
after a lot of, uh, of conferences, in fact, I'm going back to the lake. Uh, is Elvin around here? Elvin, where are you? Okay, Elvin, please stand up. Uh, this is the fellow who is responsible for his team for uh, Megatrends and the idea behind uh, using megatrends as a uh, platform for this discussion simply is this. You know, one mark of a good leader is the ability to see into the future, to treat the future as if we are looking at the past, you know, studying history. And the sense of anticipation, <laughs> a sense of trying to gauge the changes and anticipate changes before they take place. And uh, in the past, uh, most of the uh, uh, scenario painting, uh, futurology uh, exercises tend to focus on what happened in, uh, what is happening in the States, what's happening in Europe. Uh, this is really the first attempt by any uh, futurologist in trying to, to size up not only the potential of Asia, but what could be happening within the next uh, uh, decade or two uh, in Asia. Uh, a little bit uh, on the background of John Nesbitt, I also have included you know, a really, really brief summary of uh, his two other previous works. One is the, the first book that really made him his name, his reputation, and also his big bank account, uh, Megatrends, uh, basically about what is, uh, was going to happen in the U.S. And when you got a good thing going, he was on a roll, he wrote uh, Megatrends 2000, and he wrote a whole bunch of other books, but this one is about Asia. Now, this is truly the first work of uh, attempting to understand what uh, the future holds in Asia. Now, part of John Nesbitt's uh, uh, philosophy of life, he's an optimist. When he sees a glass, like this, and many people see that, oh, this glass is half empty. John Nesbitt says, no, it's half full. Good excuse to take a sip. <laughs> and the idea simply is this. He is he's a promoter of an enthusiastic uh, embrace of the future. You know, uh, change is really frightening to many people because change requires that we have to break old habits, uh, admit that uh, we make mistakes, and to deal with uncertainty. And basically what John Nesbitt in his book says is that you know, change is not necessarily bad. But at the same time, you know, if you are prepared for the changes that are coming, then you've got nothing to be afraid of. And so he was, he's trying to paint a scenario of what's going to happen in Asia. Uh, John Nesbitt lived for a year and a half in Kuala Lumpur. And so I think he, uh, in this book, you would notice that he is an honorary Malaysian. You know, he's a big promoter of Malaysia, big promoter of Asians. And uh, if you read the book carefully, I think he exaggerates a lot, uh, like I do when I teach my classes. You know, to get a point across, you, 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 you stretch the uh, truth uh, to the limits. And uh, he exaggerates quite a bit in his book. And some of the numbers, I think, are a little bit over-optimistic. But then again, the purpose of the book is to help uh, particularly people in the West, in the States, in Europe, to rethink Western, the Western world's relationship with Asia. And so I'd like to just very briefly give an uh, uh, overall background uh, as to why he wrote the book and at the same time what are some of the uh, manifestations that he sees. Obviously, one of the first things that uh, for anyone who had been out to Asia uh, would very quickly uh, realize that uh, extraordinary changes are sweeping Asia right now. And you know, this is a number that might uh, be unfamiliar with uh, many of you and even with many Americans. Since 1980, there was more trade between America, with the US and Asia, than between US and Europe. Now, uh, traditionally, most trade takes place between US and Europe, but that pattern was broken more than 16 years ago. And uh, what we're seeing in Asia is the, uh, the combination as well as the continu continuing uh, 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 progress made in this whole area. And uh, the changes are not only in trade, in economics, but also uh, culturally as well as politically. 
And as a result, uh, the West, which is what this book is written about, you know, really addressing Americans, addressing Europeans. You, we have to rethink our relationship with Asia. And uh, as an Asian, I think a wicked uh, uh, pleasure uh, in, in reading the book because I've been saying this for many years, but as an Asian, no one pays a lot of attention to us. But when John Nesbitt says it, uh, obviously he sells uh, $3 million worth of books in the first printing. Uh, one of the major uh, 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 points that uh, uh, Americans and the West needs to understand is Asia is self-confident, Asia is different, Asia is strong, and Asia requires a new contract, a new psychological contract, a new relationship based on equality. And uh, the second point here I'm you know, trying to make is that, uh, for example, uh, it is necessary for the West to see the world from Asia's perspective. The West is losing moral standing internationally, a lack of leadership, for example, in the Serbian uh, Bosnia conflict. Uh, a lot of the actions taken by, by uh, European leaders and in, in the U.S. is taken from a, uh, a European perspective. But the fact simply is this. Uh, Bosnians are largely Muslim, and that uh, they are, in Asia alone, over 500 million uh, Muslims. And obviously, take a different perspective. And if you have been uh, following the, uh, the uh, events in uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina right now. Uh, Malaysia, you know, for better or for worse, is one of the countries that is very actively supporting the uh, Bosnian uh, uh, people in the current uh, conflict. And so Asia feels very, very uh, increasingly uncomfortable as well as irritated by the West lecturing about freedom and human rights and so on. Uh, point three. <coughs> Background-wise, the Asian Commonwealth of Nations work together much better today than they have ever had. Uh, a lot of the conflicts in the past are over, and a new sense of uh, wanting to uh, come together, work together, ASEAN, for example, uh, founded uh, really uh, largely through the leadership of the Malaysian government uh, about 30 some years ago, is now the foundation for a new economic pact in Asia. Everything else seem to build around the, uh, the extension of the ASEAN concept. Uh, all rivalries are passed, a sense of uh, coming together, a sense of redefining, uh, a sense of uh, taking pride in being Asians. Uh, forged, uh, the new Asia being forged by economic integration and technology, particularly communications, travel, mobility, and so on. Uh, a uh, new coherent uh, entity uh, in Asia. A lot of changes, some symbolic and some uh, very real. Uh, major changes uh, taking place in Asia, for example, next year, uh, Hong Kong returns to uh, China. And, uh, you know, people wonder, you know, what's going to happen? But, for example, historically, uh, Hong Kong was ceded to Britain at the end of the Opium War. You, you mostly remember your history. And it was an unequal treaty. And uh, so historically, Hong Kong has always been part of China. And so for 100 years under colonial uh, British rule, in 1997, it will revert back to China. And uh, we're not talking about politics, we're not talking about ideology, we're talking about history. And so in a real sense, uh, the, the writing of a historical wrong uh, will take place. And uh, this again you know, tells us about the march of history that uh, that uh, evidently a lot of change, uh, changes are taking place. Very simple things such as name changes, you know, Peking to Beijing, Saigon become Ho became Ho Chi Minh City, Burma now is Myanmar, Bombay recently has been renamed uh, Mumbai. Why? Symbolism, small little things. And it tells of a new uh, attitude, a new confidence uh, stripping Asia. Asia is modernizing in an Asian way. In the past, Modernization means westernization. Now, modernization means we have to do things the Asian way. And it's, it, it can only come about as a result of a new uh, self-confidence. Six, Asia has half the world's population, 2.6 billion and 1.3 billion under 25. A very young uh, population. So one of the most important things, for example, Asia is, it has got to do is to educate its masses. And uh, as a result, uh, what we are seeing is a new middle class emerging in Asia, uh, spanning power, and which is really what is drawing attention uh, in the West. And uh, you know, uh, 
or other things such as why high sim rates in Asia is because of the tradition of us taking care of the family, not depending on government uh, programs, uh, social security, and so on. And it has helped change the way Asian looks. Now, very quickly, what are the uh, uh, major trends uh, taking place in Asia? First one is from nation states to, to networks. And uh, recognition, for example, Asia has always been, at least in the past uh, four decades, led by the resurgence of the Japanese economy. Um, in, in the 60s and the 70s, you know, we marvel at the quote unquote, the uh, resurrection of the Japanese economy, right from the ashes. Uh, the Japanese uh, uh, industrial complex was, you know, was basically reduced to rubble by uh, massive uh, waves of bombing by American uh, war planes to bring the war to an end. And out of the ashes you know, arose the phoenix called the New Japan. And uh, most people in the West thought it was an aberration. It was something different, unique. And over the past four decades, we realized that it's not unique. That was just only a harbinger of changes to come. And quickly following the heels of the, uh, the uh, resurrection of the Japanese economy came what was then called in the 80s the Four Dragons. South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and very quickly, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines has caught up. And so we see a, 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 a networking of uh, companies, networking of individuals, uh, networking of uh, uh, a, a, a whole new uh, class of uh, business, uh, education, uh, political uh, leaders. And uh, in the past, it's always been a love-hate relationship between Asia and Japan. And uh, most of you are too young to remember. Uh, when I was your age, I was always lectured by my grandfather. Uh, Never forget what the Japanese did to us. You know, the, the atrocities uh, during the war, the, 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 the colonization. And uh, even right now in 1996, Japan still has to face up to many of its, its, uh, its uh, wrongs during that particular period in the late 30s and the 40s. One of the big major issues, for example, is the comfort uh, girl uh, uh, crisis, where the Japanese army, for example, uh, literally took uh, uh, tens of thousands of Korean women, Chinese women, Philippine women, and others to serve in brothels uh, tied to the Japanese army. They still come to re reconcile these issues. As a result of the, the, the experience, Asians tend to trust Japan a lot less than they trust the West because they, it was not a pleasant experience. And uh, as a result, while Japan today is the dominant economic power in Asia, there's always a reluctance on the part of leaders throughout Asia to fully trust Japan. And, and this is a historical fact. And so as a result, uh, while Japan exudes, uh, you know, uh, 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 provides economic leadership uh, politically, uh, Japan really has not done a whole lot in, in this area. Largely, its influence is through trade and investment. And uh, this, uh, in, in this book by John Nesbitt, he, he paints a picture where uh, Japanese economic power is waning. I'm not quite sure. I think he, he, he might push the truth a little bit, uh, uh, read the tea leaves a little too, far, uh, a little too uh, far, a little too fast. But there are major problems with the Japanese economy. Uh, largely, I think, because you know, you, you, you can only grow so fast, you can only grow so, so much. Uh, it's a lot easier for those behind the pack to catch up than to be on the cutting edge. Last night, for example, uh, over dinner with our guest from Intel, uh, we had a wonderful discussion about, uh, about leadership, about uh, technology changes, about uh, you know, Andy Grove, who uh, is one of the co-founders of Intel. You know, when you're on the cutting edge, like Intel is today, uh, you're on the frontier. Uh, where's the future? You have to create the future. You have to create the technologies that will change the world. And how do you manage the technology you create? You have to spot the trends and so on. And so, you know, Japan is pretty much caught up in the U.S. in, in, in many ways. And it is, you know, they have no blueprint anymore. There's no more rabbits to chase. The rest of Asia is chasing the Japanese rabbit and catching up very quickly. And uh, so, in a large extent, you know, the kind of problems you see in Japan stagnant economy, uh, for example, the, uh, the uh, uh, real estate, the value tumbling because of the, uh, uh, you know, really 
natural real estate values that has been supported by the government and so on as a result of Japanese economic policies over the past few years. Uh, John Nasby reads into a sagging of confidence in Japan and that uh, perhaps the uh, rest of Asia uh, it should uh, take uh, an active role in, uh, in uh, perhaps usurping Japan's uh, place, the leadership place uh, that it has uh, established over the past uh, uh, four decades. Trend number two is from traditions to options. And basically what this means is that uh, people today in Asia have a lot more options, a lot more choices than they have had in the past. Uh, it used to be, you know, we, you know, the, especially the West looking at Asia, they tend to see us as people who are blocked in by a sense of, uh, of uh, uh, resignation. You know, our philosophies, you know, Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, uh, Islamic philosophy, that uh, we, we tend to uh, flow with the tide and so on. We, we don't take charge of our lives. Uh, what uh, we see today in Asia is that uh, there are a lot of options, a lot of choices. Uh, particularly for young people like you, who are you know uh, prepared uh, for, in terms of ed uh, university education, technical education, and so on, uh, to take uh, managerial leadership positions uh, in Asia. Uh, Asia not being uh, bogged down by uh, by uh, the welfare state in the sense that uh, the role of government tends to be fairly uh, limited. Uh, for example, new choices. Uh, Asia has developed a new type of capitalism uh, called communitarian capitalism as opposed to individualistic cap uh, uh, capitalism in the West. Instead of you know, the, 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 the Lone Ranger, the cowboy, the one with the silver bullet, uh, the Asian sense of uh, type of capitalism and people work together, pulling resources, got them royal, you know, that kind of approach uh, in developing a totally new uh, way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, fostering not just uh, economic growth but also a new uh, type of democracy that is sweeping that part of the world. What are the choices uh, in, uh, in the uh, area of uh, spirituality, for example? Uh, we see a heightened sense of uh, uh, spiritual uh, certainty, particularly among young people. Uh, we see the resurgence of a, 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 a almost uh, uh, an evangelical type of uh, Islamic faith, where young people embrace a faith with full confidence. We see the same thing with Buddhism, for example, that uh, over the past 10 years, Taiwan has sent out a lot of uh, Buddhist uh, uh, missionaries to the West. Uh, New options in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, choices. Uh, Christianity, for example, is also facing a resurgence uh, among young people in Asia. Uh, other you know other choices uh, also include uh, careers. Uh, other choices include lifestyles, and uh, I don't want to to to, to belabor this because uh, of of time. Uh, even values, for example, Asians have, have, have uh, tried to learn from the West, and uh, as a result, we, we do things differently. Uh, very quickly here, I'm not sure whether I, I've included this perhaps at the back of the whole stack here. Uh, many values appear to be, to be universal. There aren't many differences between Asians and uh, Americans or, or, or Westerners, except perhaps how we prioritize our values. Uh, top Asian, we're talking about personal values here. Top Asian values, for example, as opposed to uh, top American values. Hard work, uh, respect for learning, honesty, discipline, in that order. In, in the States, for example, self reliance, uh, hard work, not handwork, uh, achieving success in life, personal achievement. You, you see the, the difference uh, between individualism versus the, 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 the uh, uh, more, uh, perhaps, uh, collectivist uh, mindset. Uh, social values. In Asia, we value, for example, an orderly society over personal expression, personal freedom. Sometimes I think your grandparents and your parents are right. Okay. Uh, harmony. Accountability of public officials, openness to new ideas, freedom of expression, respect for authority. 
And over here in the, in the West, freedom of expression, personal freedom, the rights of individuals, resolu resolution of conflicting political views through open debate, thinking of oneself, accountability of public officials, uh, different sets of values. And yet at the same time, you know, each being true, true to itself. There's no, there's no such thing as we're right, they're wrong, they're right or we're wrong. It's just that we're different and we celebrate this kind of diversity. Uh, trend number three, it's a, a, a shift from export-led economies to consumer-driven uh, economies. Very quickly, I think Asians are the ultimate materialist. We want a good life, and we want a good life right now. Asia boasts some of the best, finest shopping centers in the world. Uh, maybe not, not now, but I've got a feeling after you know completing the uh, Petronas uh, Twin Towers in Lina City, the next project is we're going to build a shopping center that will be called the Mall of Asia, <laughs> as opposed to the Mall of America. Uh, shopping is Asia's favorite pastime. Uh, creating a, a you know, consumer-driven economy, uh, for example, the Profum Saga project. I can still remember when it was first started uh, by, uh, by Premier uh, Mahate. People were wondering, you know, uh, do we need a new car? Uh, basically, what he has done was to, uh, to, to uh, show that uh, you know, we can do it with help from the outside. We can do it and do it well. Tourism and travel, big boom in Asia. Uh, food, restaurant, businesses, booming. Radio, television, uh, uh, programs, uh, very high content, low uh, Asian content. Uh, probably heard of uh, Ananda Krishnan's uh, satellite, right? The MIA. Uh, programming by Asians, for Asians. Uh, Rena Renaissance in the Asian art today. Uh, fashions, for example. Uh, many top Asian designers, not only are very successful in Asia, but also making inroads in the West. In fact, there was uh, uh, a uh, article about uh, fashions uh, in, in, uh, in, in the West. Among the top uh, 30 designers, I think about nine of them are Asians. Fairly, fairly impressive. Government driven, contr uh, government control to market driven uh, in the sense that uh, uh, there's greater reliance on uh, Asian governments to work with the private sector. You know, for example, the Malaysia's uh, privatization program, uh, using private capital to help uh, boost economic development, economic uh, growth. Uh, very successful. The same model now has been uh, used uh, in other parts of the world. Less and less, you know, talks about ideology, more pragmatic way of looking at life. The Asian dream, so make money, make more money, have a good life. And uh, even in China, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Deng, who now is in his uh, 90th year, uh, back in 77, said right after Mao Zedong died, before that, you know, when you say things like that, you get in trouble. He said, it really doesn't matter what the color of the cat is as long as the cat catches mice. What he meant was that the, the uh, economic policy can be capitalism, can be socialism, can be communism, can be anything as long as it, that's one thing. What is the purpose of government? That is to deliver the highest standard of living to its citizens. And he knew back, you know, back in the 50s. The communism is bankrupt. It cannot deliver the kind of quality of life, not just in economics, but in terms of, of personal life, uh, uh, spirituality, and so on. And, uh, and so today, uh, China is a communist country uh, by uh, mirage. It really doesn't exist. Uh, the uh, businesses control China and not the communist party. From farms to super cities, real quick, perhaps the mixed blessing, clash of values, uh, many of us who live in rural communities, and I consider myself one of them, especially living in Ames, I will for about 15 years. I'm really your kampong boy. Uh, love to live in the, in the rural areas, clash of slower lifestyle, slower pace, love the land, love the birthplace, love the community, sense of belonging, shared heritage as opposed to massive uh, cities. But the reality simply is that uh, urbanization is the path in Asia for right reasons or wrong reasons. Uh, and uh, a sense of new confidence. You know, you, you see a lot of these major uh, building projects in Asia. Uh, uh, I think it's nothing more than a, a symbol of Asia's competitive, competitiveness in the West. You know, they've got uh, the uh, Sears Towers, John Hancock, we've got our patronus. And uh, simply because uh, we are confident today. Labor intensive to high uh, technology. Uh, 
uh, Asia has taken the technological uh, lead. And uh, the economic prosperity today we see in Asia partly is because uh, of this event. Uh, last night I learned, for example, that Intel has got its own R&D design and engineering uh, task uh, offices uh, in Malaysia. Not just assembly and putting things together, but R&D, creating the future. And the same thing is happening in Bangalore, uh, in the software area uh, in India. In biotechnology, the same thing is happening in Singapore. Uh, in uh, Taiwan and South, uh, and, and, and South Korea, they're pushing, they're pushing the, 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 the uh, envelope with regards to uh, process technology. And obviously, we see the same thing uh, in, uh, in Japan. The information age has come to Asia with a vengeance. Trend number eight, I think it's very, very important, is the a shift of male dominance to emergence of women in leadership positions in Asia. In this room, for example, I've counted that about uh, you know, a little less than half of you here are women. And that is, a, I think, a very powerful sign that uh, changes are taking place in Asia. And uh, one of my students right now in, in, in the class I teach is working on a, you know, a very simple project of term paper on the role of women in the consumption process, uh, talking about the US. So what I asked her to do was to look at uh, print advertising by the car companies from 1950 to 1995. And she zeroes, you know, the, all the print ads for magazines over the years. Do you know how women were, were depicted in ads in the 50s and 60s? They were standing there, looking well-dressed, very supportive of their husband, smiling, little children there, clean, happy, and the husband would be standing by the car, and, you know, the boss. And this is how uh, car salespeople had been taught to deal with, with, with car buyers. And uh, Christ has spent $200 million training uh, car salespeople in the past four years how to sell cars to women. Because women not only buy car, cars, they pay for it. Uh, many instances where you know, women would buy, you know, you know, uh, would buy a car and they come and look at the car and test drive it. And the guys, yeah, you know. Uh, they talk technical terms, you know, uh, 4.5 liters, uh, uh, you know, how many horsepower, and so on. Uh, when you're ready to buy, you know, uh, bring your husband with you and we'll, we'll sign. And she said, what do you mean? I'm paying for this thing. And the same thing is uh, taking place in Asia. Uh, that it is very important, particularly in Asia, where uh, most of us guys have been raised uh, in a semi chauvinist state where, you know, men has always been in charge and tend to be very autocratic and, uh, and uh, hey, guys, wake up. Smell the coffee. Times are changing, and uh, women are taking the rightful place uh, in in partnership with men uh, building the new Asia. Uh, for example, in China, the latest statistics show that the 25% of new businesses created in China were started by women. Why? Because they could not get promoted very far in the companies. They hit the glass ceiling very early, and they say, well, you know, I'm not going to stay in, stay here for the rest of my life. Uh, you know, even though I'm an executive, I have to pour coffee during uh, executive meetings. This is ridiculous. Many have struggled on their own start their own businesses. And I think it's time for, for the men uh, to realize that uh, the changes are coming. And not only because uh, the changes are coming, but because I think it is, it is, it is uh, 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 both proper and I think also smart business. You know why? Because like it or not, half the world is made up of women. If you deny you know, appropriate leadership role of women in the corporate, in, in the corporate world, in government, in education, uh, we are not utilizing some of the best resources we have. And that's a real shame. And that's a real loss. And so in Asia, we see women taking place, leadership roles in, uh, in uh, science, technology, politics, government, civil service. Last one. Last trend, west to east. And the idea simply is that uh, the shift of the global axis of influence from West to East. I think he's got overboard on this one. I don't think you know uh, the, 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 the media has changed very much. But I think the point simply is there, that the new Asia is, is exuding a new self-confidence, banking on, quote unquote, a new Asian commonwealth, ASEAN, you know, APEC, and so on. A new breed of leaders in Asia is coming together, less, na less nationalistic, more willing to work together. We see, for example, uh, uh, 
of you know uh, Muslim ascendancy in Asia. Uh, in Malaysia, for example, Mas uh, CEO uh, Tajuddin Ramli uh, arguing and providing leadership both in, in Mas as well as you know the new businesses he created that uh, Islam is not incompatible with trade and commerce. And we see this sort of thing sweeping uh, 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 other parts of Asia. And one part, you know, one, one, one part of Asia, particularly what I call you know, Southeast Asia as opposed to uh, Northeast Asia, uh, Japan, uh, China, uh, Korea, is that Southeast Asia, where you know, uh, Malaysia is an integral part, is, is this English-speaking uh, 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 world. So dealing with the West is easy because you know, uh, schooling, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, more westernized uh, uh, education, uh, picking up technologies is, is, is pretty uh, easy. And uh, while Asians are modernizing, uh, what I see uh, in, 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 the, in the West is that uh, the West is picking up uh, Asian way of life, particularly spirituality. Uh, one of the fastest growing uh, uh, religions in Italy, of all places, is Buddhism. And uh, do you remember that uh, long-haired uh, football player, you know, 1994, fellow who shot two goals in the finals, um, Italian uh, soccer player Baggio? Uh, he's one of the key uh, leaders of the uh, of a new uh, Buddhist uh, uh, missionary effort in Italy. Asia is modernizing. The West is perhaps uh, moving towards the East. Uh, I've got a lot more things I want to talk about, but I've got some other things that I'd like to use for summing up at the end of the day. Sharon uh, Drake, who is here, uh, Dr. Drake is the director of uh, training and development at ISU. She will come right after we have a very short break. Sharon, I'm sorry to use up a bit of a time, but we'll let the program slide so you won't lose the time that's allotted to you. Okay. Uh, if you have questions, kind of save your questions and we'll, we'll do it at the uh, uh, end uh, of the day. Uh, can we just take a real quick break and then uh, come back uh, when you hear the, uh, uh, the uh, glass being cleaned? Okay. Thank you.